I'm Robin Goddard and I'd like to welcome you to this program on the Walker Sisters. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and why I do a lot of Walker Sister programs. First of all, I uh, was born and raised right here in this area and Miss Elsie Burrell, who was a school supervisor in Maryville, knew the Walker Sisters very, very well. She lived right down the street from us, and I had brothers, so Daddy told Elsie just for her to take me with her whenever she wanted to go anywhere. So when I was about three or four years old, she took me to the Walker Sisters. They were her contemporaries. They were very good friends of hers, and she went out to help them do chores. She helped them cook. She helped them preserve. She helped them plant. She helped them do a lot of things. And I was just a little tag along that she took with me. First of all, when I t do programs on the Walker Sisters, I tell you the stories that I remember when I was a child. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was that way all the time. It's just what happened when I was there. And there are a lot of people that have a lot of stories about the Walker Sisters. And I just like to share what I remember when I was a child. These are the Walker Sisters. There were seven of them and they had four brothers. The Walker Sisters, if you would like to know their names, are starting on the bottom left is Margaret. She was the oldest and the strictest. In the middle of the front row is Louisa, and it's Louisa, not Louisa, and she would correct you if you said the wrong name. And next to her is Polly, who was Mary Elizabeth, and Polly for short. On the second row, the top left is Hetty. The next one is Martha, Next one is Nancy, and the last one is Caroline. Now, the Caroline, the last one on the right, is the only sister that married. The other ones did not. All the brothers did marry. This was their dad. His name was John, and they used to call him Harry John. And I want you to take a look at him. He um, always had a basket beside him that either had apples or cherries. Sometimes peaches and plums, but most of the time it was cherries or apples. He had orchards all over the place and grew over 20 species of apples. His chair he also made. He was known as a master carpenter. He made all the furniture that was in the house. Harry John, daddy of the Walker sisters. This is their home. Now, on the right hand side, you will see a porch. The original house did not have that porch. And if you walk onto the porch and straight through, that was where the kitchen was. The house was built in 1857 and belonged to Mrs. Walker's family, which were the King family. When Mr. and Mrs. Walker moved in with Mrs. King, she wanted a place where she could cook and didn't have to cook in the same room that she slept in. Bryce McFall was um, a person who lived very close by and he had a cabin. It was vacant, so Mr. Walker took the boys down. They dismantled the cabin, took it up to the main house, and assembled it for a porch and a kitchen. So that was added about 20 years later, in the 18, probably in the 1870s or a little bit later than that. These are the Walker sisters, again, as they aged with their dad. Caroline was married at that time, so she's not in the picture. 
but I want you to, first of all, we'll start with John, the dad, and his cane that he had that he whittled. And next to him again is Margaret, and then Polly, and then Martha. And on the top left is Nancy, Louisa, Hetty, and Dan. Now Dan was the youngest of all 11 children. But I want you to look closely at Hetty, who's standing next to Dan. She's the only one that doesn't have on real dark clothing. And the reason for that is that one of the traditions in the mountains was when you turned 14, you became of age. And most mountain women married when they were 14. The other girls have on dark clothing, probably because when this picture was made, they were in mourning for someone in their family. The tradition in the mountains was that you went into mourning for seven years. Now, doesn't mean that you wore the same dark black or dark dress for seven years, but you didn't put on bright clothing. And some people observed it and some people didn't. This is Caroline, the one who married, and these are her children. She had seven children altogether. Uh, three did not live. And you will see her at the bottom of this tree. Now this is one of the chestnut trees that was located in the Tremont area near Spruce Flat Falls. And she was at for, out for an outing. John, Leona, Effie, and Hazel are her children and there at the bottom of the tree. It is, the story was that this tree was hollow inside and they were logging, the Little River Lumber Company was logging this area. And when they were logging it, the tree came down and Jim Shelton, who was married to Caroline, turned it over, hollowed it a section out so that they could use it as a fill or a container for dirt when they were building the railroad in that area. Hetty and Louisa posing, which they didn't really do very often. Louisa did, but not Hetty. Now, this is the back of their farm. You will see, it looks probably like Hazel or Effie that's back there in the back. Those were their nieces that belonged to Caroline. And they had a vegetable garden where you see the railing. Um, they had the place where Effie is, what would have started the herb garden, and it went on up to the back of the house. They had uh, grape arbors, they had orchards all around their 122.8 acres that made up the Walker Sisters area. This picture was taken around 1918 and there had been an earthquake in the area. Jim Shelton, who is married to Caroline, was up on the scaffolding redoing the roof if you take a hike out to Walker Sisters, you will be able to see where the repair work was done on the chimney because the colors of the stones are different colors. This is a picture of Caroline again with her children. John is in her lap. To the left is Effie to her Right, sitting with the bare feet up on a stool is Hazel, and Leona is standing. Walker Sisters again, a picture that is very familiar to probably many of you all. Um, as the sisters passed away, Nancy passed away in 1931, before the park was established and then Polly was next. So you had what many people call the Five Sister Cove because 
there were five that lived there until they started um, to expire. This is Margaret and Louisa hoeing in their garden. You can see the, if you look carefully around their waist, that's, those are seed packets that they would had little kind of they were little bags that they tied around their waist you also notice their bonnets their bonnets had a long section in the front and in the back to keep the sun from, from uh, getting on them Louisa again planting corn which was their main crop which was also mountain people's main crops this is one of the outbuildings that is still there. This is called a corn crib and gear shed. They stored their corn and they had lots of things that they used on their animals like the harness that they used on their mule and uh, on the oxen that helped plow. They hung in different areas but this particular building is a historic building that has been redone and is on the property. It's right across from the front porch. Another picture, Margaret hoeing in her garden. This is the spring house. The spring house was on a, a little creek that ran through and the spring is located behind it. Spring houses were in all mountain homesteads. It was their refrigerator and where they preserved and kept things cold all year round. This also remains for visitors to see and has been redone and is in excellent condition. Louisa This is a picture of the barn. Now the barn is no longer there. The barn sat up on uh, kind of a hill that was behind the corn crib and gear shed. It was a place where their sheep and their hogs and the old mule whose name was Kit, and they had some cows at one time. Every once in a while you'd see a goat, and they had chickens, and they even had some turkeys. But they, um, kept a lot of stuff in that barn. The barn, of course, is, is no longer there. Now, this is the inside of their cabin. As you can see, you're in a big room, and if you look through the doorway, almost in the middle of the picture, you will see Polly sitting on the front porch. So you're in the big room and you're looking back towards the uh, porch. The beds are three-quarter beds. Three-quarter meaning not as big as uh, a full-size bed, but bigger than a twin bed. Their dad made them the trundle bed, which is the bed that fits underneath that you see the coverlet on pulls out and they used that for guests when they came to spend the night. That was the bed I slept on all the time. We'd pull it out in the middle of the floor. On the walls are newspapers. Now, the newspapers served several purposes. One, it kept all little buggy boos out from flying through if there was a hole where the chinking had come loose. It also served as a form of insulation, even though it wasn't really insulation. But it, there, the main purpose of the newspaper on the wall was to reflect light. They had no electricity. So if you had lighter colored walls, when the sun shone in the windows, it reflected and you had a lot more light in the room. I remember as a child, they did spring cleaning and it was in March every year. We boiled water outside in these big vats and we used muslin and we brought the muslin in and wet rags and took all the newspaper off the wall. We scalded the walls 
and took it all down. That was, took all the furniture out. That was the spring cleaning. And then we made a paste. Margaret, of course, was the oldest and she told us what to do and we did it. She uh, made a paste out of flour and water and we painted the walls with a paintbrush and put the newspaper back up. I remember when we went from regular black and white newspaper to comic strips and we had colored wallpaper. And then as it became uh, time closer to today, we were able to get um, wallpaper samples from some of the guests. They would bring the wallpaper books up and we would have patchwork. We would have those squares on the wall. And then eventually visitors started bringing them rolls of wallpaper. So when each one of them lived their life, it changed, the walls changed shape and color. They did not have enough room to have chest of drawers, so if you'll check underneath the ends of the bed, you'll see um, trunks. They had lots of wooden pegs they hung stuff on. And to the left of the door that goes out to the porch, you'll see a ladder that goes up to the loft upstairs. When the girls were young, they slept downstairs with their parents and the boys slept upstairs. Their beds looked more like army cots than they did bed beds, but the girls always slept in these. Louisa, Martha, Hetty. Hetty is the one over on the left. <clears throat> this is a cotton gin. We don't think of cotton growing in these hills of the mountains, but they raised cotton. They used it to put in their quilts that they made for batting. They also used cotton to make material out of. They ginned those cotton balls to get the seeds out. I think, if I remember correctly, I believe the gin was made out of um, oak and then the turning part of it, the gin part of it, was probably hickory because it didn't split. They used to tell the story that it took three of them to run the cotton gin. One to feed it, one to turn the handle, and one to tell them what to do. So the, that's another picture of the cotton gin. And this picture shows, I'm sure those are Hetty's hands. They look just like her hands that are feeding the cotton through the rollers to get the seeds out. After the cotton was ginned, we would wash it with lasso that was of course homemade. We'd hang strips different places to dry and then we would take <clears throat> piles of it and cart it. You had two brushes you had that looked like they had nails in them and you would put the cotton on one and separate the fibers and make sure that it was clean and you would do it over and over. I thought that my arms were going to break because Margaret would come by and feel it and it, when you first started carding it felt more like steel wool and she wanted it so soft that we would card for hours until we reached the texture that she wanted. This is Hetty, <clears throat> knitting socks. She was known for her knitting abilities, and she used to tell the story about Dan. Now, Dan was the youngest boy, and he was in World War I. And during the wintertime, they would send him hand knitted socks because they didn't want his feet to get cold in Germany 
And she used to tell people that she bet there wasn't anybody over there that could tell them that their hand-knitted socks came off of an old mountainside from some sheep that were owned by the ants. This is the fireplace in the big room. The other picture would have been from where uh, we're sitting. And to the left was one, another bed and to the right another bed. And I'm not sure if you can see on the floor, on the bed on the right, there are uh, baskets and in those baskets were many quilt squares. When I was growing up, we had many, many quilt squares that they would uh, cut and use different materials for. Above the fireplace are just little knickknacks and things that, that uh, they collected through the years. And if you see the frame, the two pieces of, that are right above the mantel, that are long from one end to the other. That is part of a quilting frame that they hung and put up out of the way. Now, when I was younger, there was a black, um, I guess you would call it a fixture in the fireplace that a great big black pot hung on. And they would use a instrument that looked like a tire rod and they would pull it in and out. And, in that pot, there were always dumplings of some kind, cooking or beans of some kind. They also had two cook stoves that were located in the kitchen. Here's Martha Jenny Cotton again. It's another picture of the big room. You can see the Again, the two beds, and there's another chair. Mr. Walker made all of the furniture that you see. Another picture of Louisa. She was my favorite. She also was the sister that lived the longest. She was the one who wrote all the poetry and loved to laugh. She loved to laugh. This is a picture that was put in here. Um, I need to give credit to Micah Day, who is our park librarian, that uh, this picture is the Walker sisters' house, but it's turned backwards. Hetty again. Now, this is a picture that you probably haven't seen. Um, this is Martha in the dark dress and in the white dress with the, the um, decorations on it is Effie and Caroline is at the back. It shows them with their hats on. It, they were either going to um, a religious service maybe on Easter or they were all maybe going I don't I don't know where they were going but it looks like they were probably going to something that involved um, a get together. Effie and is uh, Caroline's daughter and then of course Martha is one of the Walker sisters. Another picture of the sisters. Now this might be a good time for me to tell you about their personalities. The one on the left with their hand on the post is of course Polly. Polly was um, engaged to a man whose name was Cotner. And next to Polly is Margaret. And next to Margaret is Hetty, who's in the middle. And then Martha, and then Louisa. And the little boy on the end was probably a nephew. They used to take care of him off and on, he'd come out and spend the day. But we'll go back and <clears throat> look at some personalities. Polly, the first one, <clears throat> excuse me, on the left, was known for being a wonderful 
cook, seamstress. There were lots of things she could do. But when she became engaged and her fiance was killed in a train accident, it did something to her. She never was able to recover from it and it affected her mentally. The sisters always would say, poor sister Polly. She died of a broken heart. So she had problems mentally after her, her fiance was killed. Margaret, the next one, was um, of course the boss. She was an excellent cook, seamstress. There was nothing that she couldn't do. When I was younger, I was very afraid of her because she was so strict. And I used to call her the benevolent dictator because she would tell you what to do and you didn't know whether she was mad or not. She never dated. She never was interested in getting married. Her whole demeanor was to take care of the homeland, to take care of the place where she was born and raised and her parents were and her grandparents were. And she really encouraged those other ones not to marry because there wouldn't be anybody to help her take care of it. She um, was really quite nice. As I grew to a teenager, I got where I really liked her, but when I was little, I was a little bit afraid of her. Hetty, in the middle. Hetty was known for her seamstress abilities. Um, Hetty left for a little while before the Depression and lived with her sister Caroline in Knoxville and worked at a hosiery mill. But the Depression hit, so she came back. Martha. Martha was very quiet. She also was known as a very, very excellent cook. She was the finance director for all the sisters. She was their accountant and she would have spreadsheets that looked like we use a computer today. They were sheets that she kept all of the business on and she also was responsible for ordering things from Sears and Roebuck and from different seed companies. She took care of all of the, the money issues. And then Louisa. Louisa was good at everything she did, but she wasn't known for one specific thing. She laughed and she had a great time and she loved visitors. And she always invited visitors to come in and sit a spell. But those five ladies, even though they lived a long, wonderful life, people used to think that something was wrong, that they wanted to live as they did in the 1800s. But that was the only way of life that they knew. They were all Primitive Baptist. Their dad was Primitive Baptist. They were very religious. Now, Martha also was engaged. She was engaged to a man whose name was John Daniels, and he also was killed in a logging accident that happened with Little River Lumber Company. She mourned his death for her seven years, and she came out of it just fine, but she also was able to to help take care of the property. The, the, the deaths of those girls were felt by people everywhere because they had such a following of visitors that would come and visit. But I'm, I'm going to, to talk to you a little bit about that. The Saturday Evening Post came out in April of 1946 to do a special on these old women that lived like they had in the 1800s. And they became instant 
movie stars overnight. The, they were mountain people, just like all the other people that lived in what is now the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. They weren't any more special than anybody else. But after they were in a colored article in the Saturday Evening Post, which at that time was the most widely read magazine in the whole United States, they became very famous overnight and people constantly wanted to see this living history. These ladies that were living in a national park as a living history example. Thoughts of Mother and the Old Spinning Wheel. I told you that uh, Louisa was known for her poetry. <clears throat> she sold poetry. They sold little quilt squares. They sold all kinds of little things and if they had a good crop they would sell even some of their canning goods and their jellies and their apple butter and they had honey that was in bee gums not they didn't have um, the white or the bee houses that you see today they had all the bee gums were in the old chestnut stumps but this is an example of Louisa's work and you, um, you might want to, to take a look at it. Back to my childhood, my thoughts often still, to my mother's gentle footsteps as she turned the old spinning wheel. In from the winter and with its cold rain and snow, my mother used to spin in our home so long ago by a good warm fire and a pine knot light. She would spin many yards of thread at night. Mother's chair is now vacant, though I dream of her at night and miss her in her home. She always made so bright. Louisa Walker. Louisa churning butter, which she did about every three days. Martha and Polly sitting on the front porch. They had many characteristics that their mom had instilled in them, even though she died at almost 20 years before their dad did. She loved flowers, so Louisa really carried that tradition on. They had over a hundred species of flowers that were around their place. Another um, interesting note that was in the archives, this was written by Hetty. Now, I'll stop and tell you that the Walker sisters went to Little Greenbrier School, which is at Metcalf Bottoms, their dad was responsible for building the school, which also served as a church. And all the girls went through the fifth or sixth grade. They didn't go any farther. That was the, where they ended. Their brothers attended and went through the third grade. But she wrote this, Hetty wrote this note to one of her nieces, and it was... Um, Miss Mary Jane Walker. Now, Mary Jane was one of the boys' children. Dear niece, I'd like to come to school. And I think she's probably left a word or two out. But she's telling her niece that she needs to do a really good job and be a good girl and try to learn as much as she can if she wants to be a school teacher. Your aunt, Hetty Walker. I think it's wonderful that we have the opportunity to look at these things. This was written in October of 1906. Louisa standing on the porch. Again, she was the last of the sisters to live. <clears throat> And this picture 
is taken the year that Margaret, Margaret was the oldest girl. She's in the wheelchair, Louisa is on the left. You will notice the wallpaper on the wall, and those are sheets of wallpaper. Margaret was 92 years old. This picture was taken in 1962, the last year that Margaret lived. And Louisa was left. Louisa never lived in the house by herself. There was always nieces and nephews, or Miss Elsie and I were always there with her. And um, she lived two more years. She passed away in 1964. But this is the last picture, and I'm going to take some t just a few moments to tell you about the Walker sisters' reason of being a living history example for the National Park. When the park was established, land was purchased by the Tennessee and North Carolina commissions, and the deeds were then given to the federal government so that a park could be established. Many people, and when we tell the story, we say, yes, it's for 50% were very much in favor of raising their lifestyle and were able to accept what was offered for the, their property. There were over 6,000 people that lived in what is now the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and all of their land had to be purchased. There were over 18 lumber companies, and obviously the lumber companies owned land and equipment and had the ability to receive more money. There were about 50% of the people who lived also in the park that were very against it because they were having to give up their home, their land, their home that their went back generations. And the Walker sisters were one of that group of people. Well, as time went on, the land was purchased and the park, as we know, became a reality in 1934. The Walker sisters were still living in their home and were negotiating with the Tennessee Park Commission and they were still very much against selling and having to move. So as time continued on, their land was at a point where it was going to be condemned and they were going to be bodily removed off of it. Washington sent a Mr. Myers down to talk with them and convince them that they needed to sell. He told them to get some help from a lawyer or from some legal advice, and they negotiated back and forth, back and forth, every time making sure that they were included in a lifetime lease that allowed them to live in the house until the last person passed away. And eventually they reached an agreement because they were, there was no uh, time left. And the Park Service was not wanting to cause any trouble because it would be bad publicity if you moved five old ladies out with no place to go. And they didn't want that negativism to come out. So they negotiated for 122.8 acres, $4,750. It was put in the bank, and the rules of living in a national park were explained. No hunting, no fishing, no cutting trees. Putting your livestock behind fences. All of these were regulations that were given to them. However, they did allow the Walker sisters to 
be able to cut wood because they had to be able to keep their um, fires going so they could eat and so they could have heat in the winter time and all the and wash their clothes and all the things that they needed a fire for. They also took care of the Walker sisters. They checked on them frequently and made sure that they were not swamped with too many visitors at one time. The Walker sisters are a legacy that many people around the world really follow. They are fascinated by their lifestyle. I was very fortunate because I knew them. I was very fortunate in being able to learn certain things from them. However, I was raised the same way. The Walker sisters, mother and daddy, left them a legacy that will be forever. And it was first to love God and second the ability to have the knowledge to farm and to do work and the last one to love your home and your family. Their legacy is wonderful. I am so happy I was part of it.